That's Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So Acts chapter 1, I'll be reading from verses 1 to 11 on page 1095. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of all the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, let's keep our Bibles open in Acts chapter 1, and I hope you've got an outline. You'll find it on the reverse of the notice sheet. On the 2nd of June, 1953, Elizabeth was crowned queen. But what then? Well, did you know, first of all, they had a celebratory meal of coronation chicken, and that was the meal invented for that occasion. But what then? Well, in the first year of her reign, she visited her realm. And within that first year, Elizabeth went to Bermuda, Jamaica, Panama, Fiji, Tonga, New Zealand, Australia, Sri Lanka, Uganda, and actually more, but I can't list them all. But it turns out that today she is yet to visit every country of the Commonwealth, and therefore it's likely she never will. But instead, what if someone was to be crowned ruler We could say not just of a nation or even of a commonwealth, but ruler of all the earth and heaven as well. I mean, that is almost too big an event to begin to comprehend. But what if that has already happened? Not just in theory, but in practice, in reality. That person has been enthroned over all. What then? Well, this afternoon we come to start our new series in the book of Acts. We'll be looking at it up till Christmas. And today we look at the opening 11 verses. And as we begin, we see the story so far. Look again at verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. 
Well, Acts is the sequel, so it's not the beginning of what's been written. It's Luke who is our author. And again, this part of the volume is written to Theophilus. Now, Luke's gospel, so the first part, is a stunning document. Luke wrote to describe the works and the words of Jesus. If you haven't read Luke's gospel, or can I say even haven't read it recently, then please read it this coming week if nothing else, to prepare for our series in Acts. If you haven't got a copy, Ralph, by the door, ask him on the way out, and he will give you a copy of Luke's Gospel. It's essential reading before the book of Acts. And yet, wonderful as that Gospel account is, look what Luke now says at the beginning of his second volume. He said, back there, he only recorded what Jesus began to do and to teach, which means there must be more. But that may be puzzling. What could Luke mean? Because if you've read the end of his gospel, as we just have heard, Jesus left and ascended into heaven. Well, Luke clearly wants us to think about that and he'll get on to it. But first, he recaps and summarizes the end of his gospel. Look in verse 3, where he says, Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering. Now, hey, look, I'm presenting myself alive to you today, but of course, that's no big deal because I haven't yet died. But Jesus is the one who suffered even to death on a cross. Maybe as that sentence was read, it didn't even register. We are so familiar, over-familiar. Jesus rose from the dead and was walking our earth. Imagine you discovered that for the very first time. At the very least, you'd think that must change everything. But how? Obviously, someone presented with this claim might wonder, well, is that true? Could it possibly have happened? Well, Luke reminds us here that for 40 days, Jesus gave many proofs. He appeared in person. He spoke to his stunned disciples. Death really is defeated. So again, we're asking, well, what now then? What next? Now, Luke is going to build slowly and lead us to the answer But he begins by recapping again what Jesus did when he was with his disciples in these 40 days, that Jesus spoke by his Holy Spirit. It's there in the second verse, quite simply, Jesus spoke through the Holy Spirit. Now again, that may not be particularly unexpected, especially for those first disciples. In fact, if you've read Luke's Gospel, you know Jesus was baptised in the Spirit early on. The Spirit descended on him, and if you like, for years the disciples had seen and heard what the Spirit did through Jesus as Jesus spoke and acted. But it seems Luke wants to just remind us of that at this point, and we'll have to think why. But it does wonder, at the very least, well, what was he saying then? And that summary then comes at the end of verse 3. Jesus spoke to his disciples about the kingdom of of God. Again, that is not new news. Luke's gospel presents for us the evidence that Jesus, the man who walked over us, must be the Christ, the King that God has promised. And now this side of his resurrection, there is no doubt at all that that's who Jesus is. And so, in fact, just as Jesus did all through his gospel, he speaks of the kingdom. But he does that, we're told, for 40 days. And to say the obvious, 40 days has an end point. So the question is, what happens after that, after those 40 days? Not only for Jesus, if you like, but also then for these disciples with whom he is speaking. Well, that brings us actually to the question the disciples ask him, which is recorded for us there in verse 6. So when they had come together, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Have a think for a moment. What do you make of that question from the disciples? That's the one sentence Luke records for us. They ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And I think for a start, we have to commend it. Because the disciples know, don't they? They are talking to a man who has defeated death. He really has. And so they think, surely, if someone rises from the dead, things are never going to be the same again. Surely there'll be change, transformation, not just for me individually, 
but on the bigger level, even for kingdoms, even for nations. Today, some people hear about Jesus. They've done what I suggested earlier. They've read Luke's gospel. Uh, You ask them, how did you find it? And they say, oh yeah, it was really interesting. They, are you asked, do you have any questions about it? They go, well, no, I, I agree with it. It all seems, yeah, I believe it. That makes sense. But then you look at it and their life has gone on just as it was before. And they're not bothered. It doesn't make the slightest difference, it seems. They look just the same as everyone else around. But that just doesn't make sense. If this is true, if we're not deluding ourselves, if Jesus rose again from the dead, surely that will impact me, how I live my life. In fact, how I look at the world and the world itself. And so it's a great question. The disciples ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? We'll think about what they mean and we'll see Jesus will run with the gist of this question. But first he does pick up on their use of that phrase at this time, verse 7. Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, it may be that the disciples were thinking, well, Jesus is alive. The kingdom will come in full pretty much straight away, immediately. Well, no, it's not that. Or it may be the disciples had grasped, because Jesus had told them enough times, that there was going to be a little delay. But instead, they are now asking, okay, well, what's the date? We'll put in the diary, we won't forget it, and we'll hang on for that. But again, no. The Father does know those details, but they are not for those disciples or for us to know. Because Jesus doesn't want their attention focused in the wrong place. But he very much agrees with their emphasis. The kingdom is and is going to be a very big deal. And what's more, It is very far from the case that the disciples are going to, if you like, sit back and wait for that date when the kingdom finally comes in. No, Jesus wants them and us to know that we have a part to play. First, these disciples are to speak by the Holy Spirit. Did you notice we jumped over verses 4 and 5? And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Now, this is a remarkable promise from Jesus, especially if you've read Luke's gospel. Again, it's obvious in Luke that Jesus is unique, obviously. He's the chosen one from God, sent from God, and he received as part of that, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit. But now on this side of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus tells his disciples, you too are going to receive the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples were right to connect that with the coming of the kingdom. Hence that question, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Another thing maybe to notice in the question is notice, well, who the disciples think is going to be doing this restoring. They begin, don't they? Will you, Jesus? That's their question. And first and foremost, again, that is right. The risen Jesus is king of the kingdom. He will do what needs to be done. And yet with that, Jesus does want to tweak their thinking, to put it lightly. He wants them to realize what they seem to have missed that they had a key part in what was going to happen. Notice how verse 8 begins, but you. There was something for them. Everything had changed and they had a role. What they were going to do was not on their own, not in their own strength. That's why the Spirit was given, to equip them and strengthen them. But they would be doing something, doing this work. In fact, verse 8 goes on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Can you imagine hearing that from the risen Jesus to his disciples, saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you? Obvious question, why? For what would they need this outpouring of the Spirit to enable them, to equip them, to give them power? Well, Jesus tells them they were to witness to the King. 
verse 8. You will be my witnesses. Witnesses, obviously, are those who speak. And notice about whom the disciples are now going to speak. Jesus says, my witnesses. So this now helps us see all that was happening in Luke's gospel again. There's a reason Jesus called those first disciples to follow him from the beginning, to be with him, to hear his teaching, to see the miracles, to go all the way from Jesus' baptism, through his life, through his death, right through to the resurrection, because having seen all of those things and heard them, now they could bear witness. And notice, therefore, who the disciples are not primarily to be bearing witness about. They are not to be primarily witnesses to the Spirit, to be speaking about him all the time. Now, of course, they are going to be utterly reliant on God's Spirit, that they might speak of Jesus. Nor are the disciples primarily to go and speak of their own experience. Now, they have the most amazing personal testimony. And there is a place for us and them to describe how we came to know Jesus and the difference that makes. But again, the focus is to be speaking of Jesus and witnessing to him. Now, we today are obviously not these first apostles who <clears throat> physically lived with Jesus. They were unique, and next week we'll think a little more about their special role. But again, this is volume two. Remember, Luke wrote his gospel. And what was Luke doing in his gospel? Well, he was witnessing to Jesus. How could he do that? Well, he tells us he put together an orderly account of what he had heard from those who from the beginning were the eyewitnesses. So the point is, Luke is saying, if you've read his gospel, if we've read that, we have seen and heard Jesus. And if we've gone where the evidence leads, we've realized he's the king who's alive. And now we too can pass on what we have seen and heard. So let's take stock of where we've got to. The 40 days are coming to an end. And just notice how Lucas has structured these verses to make, well, an obvious point or two. He highlights for us what we knew already, that Jesus spoke by the Spirit about the kingdom. But now Jesus was going to leave physically and the disciples would be given the Spirit to speak about the king and his kingdom. So you see that pattern, which shows us, doesn't it, at least a couple of things. It underlines that the disciples, really, their role, our role is to do the same in that sense as what Jesus did. But there's also another thing, if we put it together with what Luke began with, it also means Jesus is not about to stop working. Somebody might think that what we have in front of us here is like one stage of a relay race, where if you like, Jesus has done his bit, quite an important bit, dying and rising again, but then he hands over the baton, and now it's up to others like us to get on with the work while Jesus puts his feet up on the throne. But remember Luke's words at the beginning. He says, before what I told you was only what Jesus began to do and to teach. So that means now, even though Jesus has physically left and ascended, he is continuing to be at work through his disciples. And that is to be a great encouragement to us. In our witnessing, in all of life, we are not alone. But as we seek to put into practice what Jesus asks of us, well, we are there not simply laboring in our own corner, not trying to do our own thing at all. This is what Jesus asked us to do so that he will continue to be at work by his spirit, but through us. In fact, this is I think meant to be an exciting time to be alive as you read this. We are in this post-resurrection era. We have seen what has been done and now we play our part as the Spirit is at work in power within us, through us, getting this witnessing out. Worth taking a moment to think, but what does it look like, even we might say feel like, to have the Spirit of God at work in power through us. Maybe the disciples wondered that question as Jesus said it. 
to them here. And of course, there's plenty of misconceptions around of what it means to have the power of the Spirit at work in us. But Acts will show us the reality as we read on in this book. For those original apostles, there were also for them signs and wonders, especially as they broke new ground with the gospel. And yet read on in Acts, and I don't think that is particularly the emphasis. We read on, what happens to spirit-empowered Christians? Well, they witness to Jesus, first and foremost, but what does that look like? Well, it means, as we'll see, they get chased out of town and have to flee. They get arrested and end up in prison, like Peter. They endure much hardship, like Paul. Even they are stoned, like Stephen, or they lose their head, like James. That is spirit-empowered Christian witness. It shouldn't really come as a surprise to us. Jesus, of course, was filled and empowered by the Spirit. And then notice again that reminder in verse 3. Very simply, Luke said, he suffered, preparing the way for us, his followers. And yet, even though that is what it might look like, that's the expectation much of the time, well, still we will find people will hear the message and believe it and become members of the kingdom. And so when Jesus' disciples persevere and keep on doing that, even at great cost, we are to conclude there is the Spirit of God at work, Jesus at work, continuing to do and to teach. Then the next question is where? Where is this Spirit-empowered witness to take place? And that brings us to a key verse, really, for the whole of the book of Acts, verse 8 where Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, clearly, this is describing a geographical expansion, starting with where the disciples are in Jerusalem, then going to the surrounding region of Judea and Samaria, and then to all the earth. But it's not simply or only geography. This is all showing to us a new stage in God's dealings with humanity. Let's take each stage in turn. First of all, in Jerusalem. So do you remember King David long ago had established his rule over God's people, Israel, in Jerusalem. Then his son built the temple. And from then on, God's people had made regular pilgrimages to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices in the temple, to celebrate the festivals. And the general direction of travel was towards Jerusalem. But in Luke's gospel, Jesus said, and Luke recorded, that the Jerusalem temple would soon be destroyed. But what would that mean? Well, the disciples were to tell the people of Jerusalem that all that the temple and the sacrifices had pointed forward to were now a reality in Jesus. So they didn't need the physical temple, they needed Christ. So the witnessing would start there in Jerusalem. But it wouldn't stop there. Now the direction of travel, if you like, is outwards. Next, in all Judea and Samaria. Let's go back to the history of Israel. So the rule of David and Solomon, they were golden years for Israel in many ways. But it didn't last. After Solomon, do you remember the kingdom split? We had Judah in the south and Samaria, essentially, in the north. So God's people now, the 12 tribes, were divided And this division continued for generation after generation. But then the prophet Ezekiel in particular promised one day God's spirit would come in a new way on God's people and all Israel would be brought back together. And the point is that day had now arrived. And the more general point for us is that only Jesus and the news about him can bring true and lasting unity between people. There is no other way apart from hearing and trusting Jesus. So therefore, the disciples were to witness in all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. End of verse 8, to the end of the earth. Again, let's just try and shake ourselves out of our over-familiarity with this. So just imagine 
Someone came up to you and said, I've got a favor to ask if you like. I want you to tell something to other people. And you say, well, well, what do you want me to tell them? Well, I want you to tell them about me. Okay. Well, well, well who should I tell? Well, well, they say not just one or two others, but everyone. And you say, well, <laughs> everyone where? Well, everyone in your immediate circle, everyone you see day by day. In fact, travel far and wide to every corner of the world and tell them about me. I just remember when this was first said, this was a day with no cars or trains or aeroplanes, no phones or internet or social media. The person is asking you to walk, maybe get on the back of an animal, maybe undertake a dangerous crossing by sea, go and find people and talk to them about me. Can we grasp the weight of what Jesus is saying? If it wasn't Jesus, you'd think, this person is insane. Except we've come to see who Jesus is. And not only that, with all the scriptures behind us, we know this isn't a new idea. This is the plan coming to fruition. Long ago, God said to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And then Isaiah then explained that one day God would send his servant, his suffering servant, to put right what had gone so wrong with the world. Isaiah 32 tells us that when this happens, the Spirit would then be poured out on God's people from on high. Then Isaiah 43, one among many, says God's people would then be witnesses. And Isaiah 2 tells us, the word of the Lord would go out from Jerusalem. That is the time that Jesus is saying has now come. And why do this? Why would the disciples, we, upsticks with this new challenge and priority of going to the ends of the earth? Do you remember those words we began with from Isaiah 49? The Lord God is speaking to his servant and says this, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The king is alive. He is raised from the dead. He is enthroned over all people. He suffered and died to bring forgiveness, that is salvation, for all who need it, which is everyone, whether Jew or Gentile. And now is the time for the people of the King to bear witness about him in the power of the Spirit. And it is not only for the good of the hearers, although it certainly is the very best news that anyone alive could ever hear. But as Isaiah tells us, it is because Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of the trust and the praise and the adoration of all the peoples of the earth. And of course, Jesus hasn't changed since he said these words. So this is as true today as when he first said it. Verse 8 gave us the geography. Verse 9 to 11 focuses, if you like, on the history. Let's look at those. Verse 9. When Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, did you notice there, Jesus gave us two fixed points in history. The first being his taken up into heaven, and the second being his return in the same way. And now obviously today one of those has happened, but not yet the other. So therefore as we read this, we are in the same essential historical time period as those first disciples were. And so what Jesus said was the priority and the focus at that time still is in force. The people are to witness to Jesus in the power of the Spirit going to the ends of the earth, to every kind of person. And in our series in the book of Acts, we are going to see the beginnings of that story. 
we'll find the disciples will bear witness in Jerusalem and thousands will turn to Christ. The message will go into Judea and Samaria and then into all the earth. In fact, the very last verse in Acts tells us that Paul was in Rome, essentially symbolizing the ends of the earth. What was he doing? Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. But obviously, Jesus has yet to return. So Acts 28 is not the end of the story. The work goes on. For the last 2,000 years, people sometimes say, well, where is your Jesus today? Well, he's at work and has been. And it has looked so weak at times, as spirit-empowered ministry so often does. And yet with hindsight, we can say it has been so effective. And that is putting it mildly. I don't know how many millions and billions have recognized and confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, we could even chat afterwards, couldn't we? Where were we in the world when we heard, first heard the news about Jesus? Who was it that took it and brought it to us? But still today, that second fixed point in history is yet to happen. Jesus has yet to return. The work, therefore, is to go on. And it is, isn't it? All around the world today, we can see some places where it's very obvious that Jesus is still working. Many are turning to Christ. It is wonderful. Here in the UK, in London, it doesn't seem so promising, does it? Sometimes maybe quite the opposite. But there is still work to do. And Jesus is working because people are bearing witness about him. Isn't this just a super passage for us to have, if you like, at the start of our new year at St. Helens as we try and get going again after restrictions, after the summer? Jesus, quite clearly, is setting our priority for the days in which we now live. And so that must shape every part of our life as a church family. It makes sense for us as a church to have mission partners, those who go cross-culturally, maybe to translate Jesus' words, to share it, to teach it, and maybe to train others to do the same, and for us to support them practically, financially, and in prayer. So as Jesus' people, we are supporters. We get behind what Jesus has said here. But of course, we are also witnesses, all of us who know Jesus the King. It will look different for each of us in different ways. Some day, some of us may end up ourselves going to another end of the earth, specifically to share this message. But of course, for all of us, it starts in some way with the person we'll be interacting with tomorrow. And we won't just be looking at the people we like or are like us. We know Jesus is for all. It's great, whoever we meet tomorrow, however difficult we find them, however different they are to us, this is for them. And actually, if our desire is like Jesus to reach the ends of the earth, well, isn't London the most wonderful place to be in that God has brought the ends of the earth, its peoples, to us? Some of us here this afternoon might be quite new to London. Others of us have been around a bit longer. I guess all of us have moments when we wonder, why am I here in London? Well, here is the answer for you. Finally, just as we finish, and we really will, did you see the emphasis in verses 9 to 11 on seeing? There's a repetition in those verses. While they were looking out of their sight, gazing into heaven, stand looking, you saw him. What's Luke doing? Well, for a start, it's underlining again, this is eyewitnesses. They could testify to what they had seen. But not only that. I think there's maybe a little edge to those angels' words in verse 11. Why do you stand looking into heaven? That is, they've seen Jesus go. And now, he has gone. The physical Jesus has left. You won't see him again until he returns. But in the meantime, don't just stand there. There is work to do. Jesus' work bear witness to the King in the power of the Spirit to the ends of the earth. I'll lead us in a prayer.
Our Father, we praise you that Jesus suffered and rose again and is alive today, enthroned as King over all nations. We do thank you for the way Jesus has been at work down the centuries, drawing people into his kingdom. Thank you for those who witness to us. And so we pray that this news about Jesus would continue to go out by the power of your spirit into all the world. For Jesus' sake. Amen.